Funding for Not a Vampire is provided by viewers like you. Find perks and tiers at patreon.com slash not vampire. Thank you. Am I really going to make a video about Peter Pan every time I take a hiatus? Sure. There are a lot of retellings of J.M. Barrie's 1905 play and subsequent book out there. The silent one, the racist Disney one, the Russian one, the suicidal one, the boring one, the other racist one, the prequel, the sequel, the sci-fi channel prequel, and so many more. Part of me has to ask, why? Don't get me wrong, I adore the Peter Pan story, but honestly, I don't think it deserves my love in its base state. Like, I've read the book. The narration is the most interesting part of it. At its core, Peter Pan is racist, sexist, and doesn't make a good vehicle for any character development or plot-driven storytelling. There's a reason why the musical is merely the length of a feature film in a genre where shows are at minimum two hours long. And while I love exploring the small nuances of retellings of the same basic story, I have to admit the more interesting works are the ones that use the original plot and characters to tell an entirely different tale like 2020's Wendy or 2015's Peter and Wendy, where you as someone who grew up with the framework narrative can appreciate how the telling reshapes it into something new, expanding on the idea of a Neverland and what Peter means to the Wendy character. There is, however, one version that is perfect. That encapsulates everything I love and have ever enjoyed in the Peter Pan story. The one that takes the framework I grew up with and expands the tale beyond the original. That, my friends, is the underappreciated 2003 Peter Pan. This movie is a masterpiece. It's just so damn good. I get the thrill of flying off to Neverland, the whimsy of make-believe, the struggle to understand feelings you as a child are experiencing for the first time, and the excitement of going against a dark foe. Just the adventure alone is fun. Jason Isaacs makes for a terrifyingly charming hook and a pitiful yet relatable Mr. Darling. He knows how to play into the intrinsic slapstick involved when being chased by the crocodile without sacrificing the menace he needs to possess in other scenes. He just owns every scene he's in. You can believe that he'll gut you just for looking at him the wrong way, but melt when he turns on the charm to drive his hook into the heart of your insecurities. Like, this is the gold standard of hooks for me. I can understand why Wendy is fascinated by the dark man who haunts her stories. This hook is heartless while also being haunted by the fact that Peter has everything he longs for. He's not weaker for it, but instead the film masterfully plays into his lack of love and companionship in his life to contrast Peter who is able to taste all of that without even being able to grasp it. Pan is everything Hook isn't and longs to be. Young, respected, victorious, and loved. It really deepens his hatred and makes this assumed rivalry into something more emotional for me. And then there's Mr. Darling who's very easily the most hateable character in Peter Pan. He's the one who lets his fragile ego lock Nana outside the nursery and thus allows Peter to steal away his children. He, who in many versions is directly opposed to everything childish and fun, aka everything the title character and our hero stands for. In many versions, he's shown to be remorseful, even sleeping in Nana's doghouse as her penance, but it's often played as a joke that he's still somewhat stern and commands respect. This Mr. Darling is a bit different. Yes, he still ties Nana up in the yard because he felt humiliated, but around that, he's shown to be sympathetic. At the heart of him, he's trying to do what's best for his family. He's built a loving environment for his children to grow up in, and now he's trying to give them the best step forward into the adult world by furthering his social standing. As Aunt Millicent puts it, they live in a time where especially Wendy's financial future relies on the position of her father in the bank. He's under a lot of pressure to put himself aside for his family, and at the start of the movie, we see that extended to him trying to closet his inner child to be the typical stern patriarch. We get to see him decide over the course of the movie that his children's well-being matters more than what others think of him, and that a cold authoritarian isn't what his children need to succeed. Being able to see Mr. Darling grapple with this conflict makes his decision to dash the neighbors and dash the expense seem more like a triumphant moment rather than a give me a happy ending move. Not only that, but he gets to act as an example of bravery for Wendy. As Mrs. Darling pointed out, Mr. Darling doesn't engage in physical combat, but he instead fights himself all the time to put aside his dreams for the needs of his family. This acts as a parallel later to Wendy choosing to leave her grand life in Neverland to return to her grieving parents. 
She puts aside her desire to stay for her brothers who have forgotten their parents and for the people that she left behind. More importantly, she has to leave the boy she loves and understands that she'll likely never see him again. Actually, Peter and Wendy's relationship is like the best part of this movie. This is the best I've seen it in any version I've watched. Let's be honest guys, why do Peter and Wendy like each other? For Wendy, she always seems to be charmed by how free and lively Peter is, on top of the fact that he's fascinatingly ignorant of adult things and has adventures. But what else? And for Peter, Wendy represents a stand-in for his mother and he feels some affection for her that he can't let himself understand lest he grow up, but why? Why Wendy? Because she's the only girl aside from Tiger Lily and Tinkerbell? Hell, Wendy isn't even that special because he steals away Wendy's daughter and granddaughter and so on to be his mother in the book and the musical. There's nothing special about Wendy to Peter, and most versions just leave it at this. We know they're the main sort of romantic couple, so it's just assumed that they'd be OTP if Peter grew up. Well, except in Hook. But in this movie, you actually understand why they dig each other. Wendy sees in Peter the thrill and daring that she hasn't been able to express as a growing girl in industrial London. She finds the key to the adventure she wants to write her three-part novel on in this boy who can fly, who knows how to never grow up, and who gets into sword fights with pirates. Peter sees in Wendy someone who is clever and as imaginative as himself, being able to keep up with his games and who shares his passions. Like him, she wants to be on the front line of the battle, not just watching from the side. Wendy isn't just a mother or a girl to him. Wendy is his companion in a way that the boys can't be. And that's what makes the movie more tragic. Wendy and Peter have so much to play off of in each other and they can relate so well, but by his nature, Peter can't be the partner Wendy wishes of him. While she allows herself to feel love and is open to the secrets learned with age, Peter just can't. He can't mature or express his care for Wendy in the way that she wants him because then he won't be the boy who never grows up. He can't give up Neverland and his adventures and his childish joy to be with Wendy. And she can't stay with someone who refuses to engage with her feelings as they are or who demands she gives up everyone she loves for him. It hurts to see them apart because they're so good together. It especially drives home the utter tragedy of Peter's being, that for all the things he has that no others possess, in order to stay that way, he needs to forever shirk the love of family and companionship of one who understands. It's the one treasure he's forever barred from. It's the thing that Wendy gave up Neverland and Peter for. Like, I can't even care about the dated CGI with all of this good stuff. It just washes over me because the movie offers so much more to focus on. And the best part is that it clearly was made by people who care about the original. So many loving references to the book and previous versions for that part of my brain that appreciates familiar nods to nostalgia and what came before. Like every other Peter Pan walked so this one could fly. Because this one is so good, it's hard for me to have faith in newer adaptations that try to retell the Peter Pan tale beat for beat. Especially considering Disney is getting ready to release their own live action version, I'm just left wondering... What else is there? Especially given Disney's less than capable handlings of trying to wokeify their classics, I can't say I'm expecting them to handle this particular one with grace. Like, I'm not sure or saying that the 2003 one handled Tiger Lily and her tribe perfectly, but it's certainly better than the competition, let's just say that. On top of that, the remakes tend to be just the original, but worst, at best, or dancing over the tattered ruin of everything you love, at worst. I'll happily eat my words if the film turns out to be better than that, but I'm not holding out hope when the 2003 movie is basically perfect. 